I bought an Atari STFM in excellent condition with a box and an external floppy drive for £20. I know. <laughs> I hear a lot of complaints that Retrotech is now too expensive, and if your tastes run to Amiga 1200s with 060 accelerators or Sharp 68000s, then I would have to agree. Retro can be a seriously expensive hobby, but it doesn't have to be. I came to this community quite late. I'm sure everyone has their own story about how their snooker club wasn't available in lockdown and needed another outlet for pent-up energy. My retro collection at that time consisted of the sad dregs of what I still owned over the last 30 years, strewn around my loft in various boxes. The first thing I did after deciding this was how I wanted to spend my free time was to make a list of all the machines I'd ever owned, including the many I'd unwisely sold on at the time, and then set about trying to replace them. I assumed this would take me years and cost more money than I like to admit, but it didn't. In a few short months, I ticked off every machine on that list, some of them twice, and my bank balance was relatively intact. And then I sat back, happy and content, to play with my new collection. <laughs> like hell I did. Instead, I made another list. This one featured all the machines I didn't own, but either had some connection to or lusted after back in the day. Good examples of this would be the Amstrad CPC or BBC Micro. The new list was a little longer, and again, I thought it would take me an age to complete. And to be fair, it has. I can't see myself shelling out for a ZX80, for instance. This brings me neatly to my point. There are plenty of machines out there that don't cost multiple body parts and are still a whole lot of fun to mess around with in a modern world full of clever people and cheap, crazy fast technology. You can have a surprising amount of fun on a tight budget. I know I do. The Atari ST was never something I considered during its heyday. I was much more interested in earning money and then giving it to my local pub landlord as efficiently as possible. And by the time I joined the 16-bit bandwagon, having dried out my liver and settled down, the Atari machine was no longer the choice of the cool kids. But these days, living in this future world, I find myself drawn more towards the machines I didn't originally own than the ones I was deeply invested in when they were current. Which brings me back to my point. It's a winding path, stick with me. The Atari ST now has a greater appeal to me than my growing collection of Amigas. I have more to learn, more to discover and the potential for more new experiences with the ST. And best of all, they're cheap. Those who know me well know I like a bargain. Getting the most bang for my buck is almost as satisfying as fixing a broken old machine. And so to the subject of this video. Almost exactly a year ago, just as my retro repair addiction was really starting to kick in, I can give up any time, honest. I was in the habit of checking Snakebook's charlatan place at a frankly obsessive frequency. I'd had a couple of previous lucky scores which fueled the fire for more bargains, and lo and behold, I spotted an Atari ST for the incredible sum of £20. At that price, it surely had to be a wreck, at best a parts machine. With little hope of success, I messaged the seller who happened to live just two minutes away by car and crossed my fingers. Well, the gods smiled on me that day. Even though the listing had been up for over an hour, it was still available. I'd recently missed out on a few bargains when sellers realised they'd underpriced their goods and then decided they actually no longer wanted to sell, only to put it back on sale for double the price later that same day. I'm not bitter though. I grabbed my keys and hurried over to the given address. The nice man let me into his house and asked me if I wanted to check the Atari first. I politely declined, snatched it from his hands and threw two crisp £10 notes in his general direction and scarpered, laughing like a medical mollusk. That's obviously the dramatised version I tell everyone now. I was a lot more polite and only slightly less desperate to get the machine home. Keen to test it and feel the crushing disappointment of actually buying someone else's recycling, I plugged it in. The first problem was the floppy drive, which made horrific noises and basically didn't work at all. With that grinding away, the machine flat refused to boot. I popped the case open and disconnected the sickly drive and tried again. This time I was greeted with the workbench screen. OK, calm down. I know that's not what it's called. I'm just farming for comment engagement. GEM is what greeted me in all its green glory. So it was a working, mostly, machine. With my ASCII 2SD now accessible, I gleefully started loading up random games to try out on this new-to-me system. This was going to be great. Min RAM for this is one megabyte. Oh, 
Okay, what about the next one? That doesn't run either. This one? Nope. Randomly, I managed to luck into what felt like one of the only games that will run on a 512k Atari ST. Good old Pac-Man. And it's a pretty version too. I didn't have a joystick plugged in, so I couldn't play it, but it did work. Sadly, just about every other game I tried to load from the ASCII 2 SD fell over through lack of memory. There are different revisions of the Atari STFM motherboard, some with nice empty IC positions inside for memory upgrades and some without. Ooh. My woohoo is in realisation this is a revision that can be upgraded. While we're poking around inside, let's take a look at the layout. The Atari ST range, while not as chock full of custom chips as the later Amiga computers, did have four custom chips that made this machine what it was. That empty space there is where, in a different timeline, the Blitter chip was meant to go. Sadly, it never made it into the ST line. It eventually did appear in the STE. Here is the glue chip or generalised logic unit. Sounds a bit like ULA or PLA to me. This is custom chip number one. There is the Motorola 68000 CPU, the chip that drove this generation of 16-bit machines. Not a custom chip. Six ROM sockets with two populated. I'll have to look into possible upgrades in the future regarding these. Next door is the MMU. Busy managing memory. That's custom chip number two. Under the metal shield is a VIC-2. Just kidding. In an Atari, the video chip is called the shifter. The third of the custom chips. Up in this corner at U43 are some support chips, including a Motorola MC68901 MFP, or multi-function peripheral, and a Yamaha YM2149F sound generator. Guess what that does? The last of the four custom chips is the DMA here at U31. It's a particularly pleasing board to look at. I especially like all of the chips are upside down. Sweet. So these memory chip holes, what to do about those? Well, the sensible thing would be to fill them with more memory chips. But unfortunately, as someone who hasn't worked on too many 16-bit systems, I don't have any of these laying around. I wonder what Control Alt Reese has. He loves all this Atari stuff. And that's why I've decided to go all in on the solar power videos. Oi, Reese. Oh, oh, hi Lee. Uh, how's it going? If you're not too busy, can you rummage around in your stash of 16-bit goodies and see if you've got anything to stuff in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can help out with that. Um, give me a second. How about these? Oh, lovely. Catch. <clears throat> Cheers, mate. Reese, being the lovely bloke he is, didn't just send me enough chips to populate this Atari. He sent me all the chips. He really is a lovely man. My trusty chip tester is compatible with these 41256 chips. And to help Reese out, I ran all of them through just to make sure there were no bad ones. For anyone that's taken an interest in my chip testers, I've put a link to the eBay listings in the description. There's a new version on there that replaces my original 1-bit tester. It has an extra socket for 1 megabit chips. The seller, Analog Kid, is super helpful. Right, before I could fit sockets, there's a bit of cleaning up to be done. Removing solder from holes without components soldered into them is easier than when there's a metal leg stealing the heat. So, for no other reason than I was being a bit lazy that day, I decided to tackle this job with a manual tool. You can insert your own joke here. I rate this engineer pump very highly, and for this kind of work, it does a great job. But curiosity got involved and I grabbed my old standard cheapo desoldering pump, which requires more skill to use than I possess. I couldn't make it work. The engineer one requires no timing. You can just jam the nozzle into the solder, with the iron still in place, and it just works. As I was in experimental mode, I heated up my desoldering gun and had a go with that. I was curious to see how much faster it would be than the engineer pump. And with the old solder, it was actually a lot worse. The tip was struggling to make good thermal contact and the solder refused to melt. With some nice juicy leaded solder in there, the gun performed as expected. I could probably have done this whole job with the engineer pump, but that thumb action of priming the pump ends up quite tiring. So in the end, I went with a desoldering gun.
All of the holes for the RAM and their associated decoupling capacitors are cleared, but there are a few other holes I need to clear to install some 68 ohm resistors for the CAS and RAS signals. A final pass over with braid just to grab any stray bits of solder. And I'm done. Mr. Rowe. Uh, okay, and now I'm really done. Time to start filling in some holes. Caps in place. Next up, the sockets. Block holes. Two block holes. I missed a few holes on top that weren't cleared. Sloppy, soon sorted. Blue painter's tape has so many uses, it might cost a bit extra, but it's well worth it. I next anchor the sockets in place by soldering a leg in each corner. And then with the tape removed, I press against the sockets from the other side and reflow each soldered leg. How many times do you think I burnt my finger? None! I bet you didn't see that coming. Now, it's just a question of starting at one end and finishing at the other. The 68 ohm resistors are next. I believe this was the first time I used my component bender. These are great. I do like nice even rows of resistors, which just left the chips. That looks okay. Those caps are a mess though. That's better. I put the whole thing back together but with the top cover off and plugged in my ASCII 2 SD and switched it on. Thank you again Lee off of Lee Smith's workshop. He milled this board for me on his CNC. It's a work of art. So how about those games that wouldn't load in 512k? One of them was the amazing cannon fodder, an all time favourite of mine. At the time of recording I didn't have the right cable for sound from an STFM. So I'll recreate the menu music for you using the power of my vocal talents. Got no sound till I get my cable. Success! In an effort to complete the restoration, I ordered a new floppy drive belt. As you can see, the old one was a bit worse for wear. Oh. There's your problem.
also gave it a bit of a clean and lube, but sadly it still didn't work. It might come back to life with a new set of caps, but to be honest this drive isn't much use to me, being an early single sided one. My intention is to replace it with a GoTek or possibly leave it in place. Around the back there's a switch already fitted that can swap the drive priority between the internal and external drive. I could use this old beat up external drive case and fit a GoTek inside that. What I actually ended up doing is putting the whole machine back in its storage crate and forgetting about it for a year. Is this the way? This is the way. I'll give this a proper run out at some point and maybe play some games on real hardware over on my second channel on a fun live stream. Fun for me that is, I've no idea what you get out of watching me bumble about in games. And I suppose I should really circle back around to the whole point of making this video. I bought this Atari for a frankly ridiculous price. While I didn't spend much time actually using it, I did in fact get a lot more than £20 of fun out of it. And I still own it, and intend to use it. Probably. There's no limit on how much it's possible to spend on this hobby, and there's always another thing you'd like to add to your collection. But you can have hours of fun for not much money. Not like snooker. Speaking of my collection, I did update that Twitter list and it's looking a lot healthier than when I made the first draft. Right, I think we're done here. I should say thanks to Reese for letting me have some of his stash of chips. Reese makes some of the best videos you could wish to see on the internet, all about things we love to talk about. You should probably subscribe to him. Probably to me too. And thank you again to Lee Smith for the ASCII 2SD board. He also makes cool videos on his channel and as a bonus, he's called Lee. His and Reese's channels will be linked in the description. I've been another Lee and this has been my face. Sorry about that. Which way is he going to throw it though? Doesn't matter. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that one will do. <laughs>